The More Show is in partnership with Ozark Mountain Publishing, taking readers beyond the unexplained. The comments and views expressed on The More Show are those of the people that make them and do not necessarily reflect the view of Kevin Moore, The More Show, or this radio station and its affiliate or sponsors. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Broadcasting from the UK and across the world on TV, radio and online. I bid you all good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be, in all the world's time zones. This is The Moore Show, and I'm your host, Kevin Moore. For the next hour, I'll be covering subjects that will open up your mind and provide you with information you may have never heard before. On today's show, I'm joined by my guest, Marshall Clarfield. Now, Marshall graduated with an engineering degree from Caltech in 1951. He has always been fascinated by what he considered advanced scientific knowledge in the Bible story of creation. Marshall has embarked on a quest to unravel the mysteries surrounding humanity's early history. His work has led him to publish the three books, Adam the Missing Link, Galgamesh 10 and The Anunnaki Were Here. Marshall Clarfield, welcome to the show. Thank you, Kevin. It's a pleasure to meet you for the first time and to address some subjects with your audience. Now, Marshall, just tell the audience just a bit about yourself to begin with. Okay. Um, I guess the most interesting time in my life was 1947. I entered Caltech, which is a university in Pasadena, California, in the fall of 1947. And the biggest news on campus was the Roswell incident that was not too far from Pasadena. It happened, uh, I believe, in August of 1947. Anyway, as an undergraduate and, and a interested uh, biblical scholar, I was quite curious about what UFOs were. It was the first time I really had, uh, had thought about it, uh, Kevin. And as an uh, undergraduate, I was interested in uh, many th scientific things. But the most important thing to me was where did we come from? I had always uh, had this kind of curiosity of what was the beginning of uh, our civilization. And as I proceeded through my uh, four-year uh, undergraduate courses at Caltech, I encountered some very interesting uh, answers to questions that I had. I was blessed, by the way, with uh, some magnificent teachers. My uh, physics professor was Richard Feynman, who at that time was the Einstein of my generation and also had for chemistry a fellow named Linus Pauling. And as my curiosity peaked on the subject of UFOs, I happened to ask Richard Feynman if he believed in UFOs. And uh, I got a wonderful answer, which I have reproduced uh, in my book, first book, Adam, the Missing Link. Now, I also asked Linus Pauling if he believed in God. And that answer I reproduced also in Adam, the Missing Link. These are two key uh, questions about uh, where we came from and what I'm all about. I had graduated, I guess, in 1951 from Caltech, and I had a 30-year career in industry in a wonderful company in Berkeley, California called Upright, Inc. And then I retired in 1981, having done what I was told to do as a youngster, work for one company for 30 years, and then uh, retire. But I got bored. Kevin, and uh, after traveling around and deciding I needed another activity, I, I got myself involved in the real estate industry, uh, worked uh, in the San Francisco area, which was a wonderful place for real estate yeah. at that time. Yeah. And uh, for 20 years, I was still searching for where we came from. And finally, I've entered into my third career, which is writing books about what I've discovered. And that's what I think you and I are going to talk about. Here Absolutely. This Absolutely. And I think it's a fascinating subject. It's uh, intrigued me all of my life. And I finally found what I thought was the, uh, the answer. And it was a book I read called The Twelfth Planet by Zachariah Sitchin. 
He wrote that book in 1976. I read it in about 1999. And from there on, I found what I thought was the path to the answers that I've been searching for. And in fact, it's, it's in the Bible, uh, Kevin, if uh, your audience is familiar with uh, Genesis 6-4, it says the Nephilim were upon the earth in those days, and uh, they were the sons of gods, and they coveted the daughters of man and had intercourse with them and produced the giants of old, the men of renown. And I said to myself, you know, who were the Nephilim? And Zechariah explained in his first book that the Nephilim were those who from heaven to earth came. And uh, they were called the Anunnaki. And the story, uh, as explained in my first book, Adam the Missing Link, tells about uh, a space age civilization that colonized planet Earth over 400,000 years ago. And the history of what they accomplished here on the planet and uh, the various uh, structures that they built and the fact that they, uh, in effect, modified the species that was here before Homo sapiens, which was called Homo erectus, and created Adam, the first human. And that story, uh, I felt, needed to be explained in a very understandable fashion. It took me quite a while to grasp all the elements that were necessary. So in the first book, Adam the Missing Link, I put together uh, 12 to 14 what I call irrefutable evidence that this civilization actually existed. And I think uh, we could touch on those subjects. But let's go back, if we would, to the uh, UFO incident where the Russians have recently uh, released a documentary film in which they recount the incidents that they say happened February the 26th, 1947 in the Antarctica. And what they said in effect was that the U.S. had launched a military, a naval expedition under the con command of Admiral Richard Byrd to go to the Antarctic to destroy what was suspected to be a secret Nazi uh, under the Antarctic base that Admiral, their Admiral Donitz had been bragging about before the Nuremberg trials and, and at the Nuremberg trials that their submarine fleet had created a Shangri-La base in the Antarctic. So I think the war was over in 1945 and this mission started in late 46 and went into early 47. And it was scheduled to go eight months and it was a military operation. For instance, it had the largest aircraft carrier that the Navy had. It had 20 warplanes on it. It had 12 surface ships, over 4,700 military personnel, and a submarine. And what happened, according to the Russian documentary film, which I find fascinating, was that this armada was attacked by flying saucers. They sunk a destroyer. They knocked down 12 of our aircraft, and we had many, many casualties. And that the truth of the fact is that on uh, seven weeks into the expedition, it all of a sudden turned around and returned. It, in effect, it retreated. And the question that the newspapers wanted to know at that time was why they had left so suddenly. And I'd like to read to you what uh, Admiral Byrd said on March the 5th. Pause, pause, pause. Okay, we, I've just been told that perhaps we've got some feedback when I speak. Um, uh, uh -oh. Could you just turn your volume down just a little bit? Turn my volume down, okay. Yeah. Just a, so it, as long as you can still hear me, so I'm just going to keep can talking. You? you can hear Is me okay. Better? Y yeah, you, you, you speak to me, just... just, just uh, all right, I'm, uh, I can turn it down a few more bars, but I've, I've turned it down three already. No, that's okay. We're not getting any... Let me just double check. One, one, two, one... No, that's fine. Sorry about that. We just have to start. Right. If we don't get that so right. So do we have to do, do stuff over? No, let's just... We're going to use... We're going to do something clever here. I'm going to splice that. So let's go straight from the... So just, just say again about the, ad, the Admiral's report. So the, so the ship came back... The ships came back, and, and on March the 5th, 1947, a Chilean newspaper produced the following uh, statement from Admiral Byrd. 
He said, today it is imperative for the United States to initiate immediate defense measures against hostile regions. Furthermore, Byrd stated that he didn't want to frighten anyone unduly, but that it was a bitter reality that in case of a new war, the continental United States would be attacked by flying objects which could fly from pole to pole at incredible speeds. I said to myself, my God, he's talking about UFOs. But subsequent to this announcement, he never said anything further, and the U.S. military classified all of his documents, his diary and his logs. They're still, after 67 years, Kevin, under classification by the United States government. And there was an admiral, who his name was Nibbins, who was in charge of the Navy at that time, who started to talk a little bit about this, and he was sort of put into Bethesda psychiatric ward and committed suicide somehow. They say they, so they threw him out the window. But there are these pieces of evidence that appear, are appearing uh, to substantiate the fact that the naval task force that we sent down to Antarctica was attacked by flying saucers. And the question, Kevin, is who flew the saucers? Who were they in charge of? Was it really a Nazi uh, under the Arctic uh, naval yeah. base? If so, I think they would have destroyed us totally. What happened was kind of they blunted the nose of this expedition and turned it around and got it out of there. If the Nazis indeed had been the ones who in charge of the flying stars, they would have destroyed the entire operation. They had the superior weapon. That's, that's what Nazis would have done. So I came to the conclusion that it must have been... Uh, something that was uh, uh, extraterrestrial, that what I believed now today, I call them the Anunnaki, uh, Sitchin called them the Anunnaki, this space age civilization that had colonized our planet over 400,000 years ago. And if that was true, then they didn't want us poking around down there, so they exhibited their strength and we turned around and fled. So. This having been released, in other words, how the Russians were able to do this is they declassified the KGB files that they had on what uh, Task Force 68, it's called, it was, had a nickname, a high jump, it's a military app. And the, since the KGB declassified, I think we should declassify it also, but I have not been able to find any government uh, sources other than the propaganda that they put out about the expedition, which was made in a film right. that the right. U.S. government produced to, to try to cover it up. And now there's a, a bunch of action going on in our Congress about retrieving the bodies. In other words, we, all, we don't leave people uh, around the world who have died in the cause of the United States uh, military service. We retrieve the bodies. Well, they never did back in the early 40s. And Attempts were made, but nothing was ever succeeded. So now there's a congressional resolution that says, let's retrieve the bodies. Okay, well, that's um, that's fascinating. And obviously, uh, you say it was connected to the Anunnaki, and we'll get into who they were in just a second. Um, but uh, what were they? why were they firing upon each other, in, in your opinion? I mean, what, what was there to protect there? Well, if there was a base under the Antarctic, like the uh, Nazis claimed that they had built, Donitz, uh, their grand admiral, absolutely uh, bragged about the fact that the Nazis had built a Shangri-La under the Antarctic. And uh, if they were in communication with this extraterrestrial uh, civilization, it would make sense to me that the advanced technology that we saw coming out of World War II from Germans was so advanced compared to what we had, they must have been having help. And maybe that's where the help was coming from, that they were coexisting in this space. I see. And uh, that's a possibility because there's lots of questions about where uh, they develop jet engines and where do they develop... Uh, submarines that could fire uh, wire controlled torpedoes and all the things the yeah. technology they, yeah. they'd gotten and and, and, then, uh, and then you look at Roswell for example as another historical case well, and you you suffered in the UK maybe not you personally but uh, your your relatives 
what was called V1 and V2 technology. These were uh, buzz bombs and rockets. And nobody in the, in the scientific community had anything like that, but the Germans did. And the question I have is where'd they get it? Because I think it was technology transferred, given to them by the Anunnaki, who okay. had the space, and may still be there. Okay. See, this is the interesting thing. They well, may still be. Well, Marshall, Marshall, let's just let's get into the Anunnaki. But first of all, I just want to say that a lot of your work obviously mirrors the Bible, and uh, this is fascinating to myself as well and the audience. Um, but okay, who were the Anunnaki in your opinion? The Nephilim. No, it's in Genesis 6, 4, the word Nephilim appears. And uh, the Hebrew translation is those who from heaven to earth came. So I said, well, where is heaven? Well, heaven could be space, you know, anything outside of our solar system. And if the story that comes forward from the Sitchin translations of the cuneiform tablets, which are found by the thousands in the sands of Iraq, is true, it says in these cuneiform tablets that this space age civilization who called themselves the Anunnaki indeed uh, came to our planet 400,000 plus years ago and started colonizing and searching for our gold. That was the stream of the story from the translations by Sitchin was that this advanced space age civilization called, called themselves the Anunnaki came to planet Earth in search of our gold. And uh, the evidence that now appears through my research in my second and third, and now my fourth book, is that that is in fact being proven by the uh, bigger than life uh, stone monuments that are found here on planet Earth. I'll just give you a couple examples. Um, the Giza pyramids, uh, most uh, archeologists uh, have credited that to the Egyptians, but the time element now has proven that the pyramids were built long before there was even an Egyptian civilization. They've been time dated uh, by various means back to 10,500 years ago, and there wasn't any Egyptian civilization then. So that's just one. There's uh, Stonehenge. There's uh, a place in Baalbek, Lebanon, which is called the landing platform, the place apparently where they claim that they uh, launched their uh, vessels to return the gold to their home planet and where they landed. And the magnificence, Kevin, of this particular uh, building, it's over 5 million square foot. It's a stone platform, and it's supported by three of the largest stones ever quarried on planet Earth. Now, to give your audience an idea of how big these stones are, they can see it in my book. I have pictures of it, but I'll describe it verbally. They're over 64 feet long. They're 14 feet, high, 14 feet wide and 10 feet high, and they weigh uh, 1,200 tons. Now, they were quarried about a mile and a half down the road from this platform at Baalbek, Lebanon, and... Um, we can't lift, much less transport, 1,200 tons and then lift it 36 feet in the air and place it end to end. Uh, to give you an idea, I'll give the audience an idea, I have a picture here of one of the stones. Can you see that? Yep. Down here, this bottom stone? Okay. Is that, is that okay? Yep. That's on page uh, 36. Uh, yeah, 26, page 26 of my first book, Adam the Missing Link. Uh, people should be aware that um, we have a certain technology. We are, you know, a, a civilization that uh, magnificently seems to have appeared on this planet about 200,000 years ago. And I talk about the Homo sapiens sapiens civilization that you and I are a part of and your audience are a part of. They didn't exist the species did not exist on our planet until about 200,000 years ago. In the scheme of things, evolution, as we've been taught, takes millions of years for changes and adaptation and evolution. Okay, so the species that was just before us, Kevin, was called Homo erectus. And the Homo erectus was a creature. It looked like us. It was, uh, you know, walked on two legs. 
It had no vocal cords. They could not speak. And their uh, tool making uh, had gotten to the point of wooden spears and stones. Now, that took a million, 800,000 years for them to evolve to that point. 200,000 years ago, we appear. And in 1969, we're walking on the moon. We've developed all the tools and technology to leave the planet as a, a beginning of our space age. I know. It's incredible, isn't it, when you think about it? You've got to ask yourself, you know, how did that happen? How did? And by the way, the reason I called my first book Adam the Missing Link is because there are no skeletal remains between Homo erectus and Homo sapiens. If we had indeed evolved yeah. from that species, there would have been tons and tons of micro changes that evolution would okay. cause to produce this. Okay, we're going to take a quick break there, so stay tuned and we'll be right back. The Moore Show is in partnership with Ozark Mountain Publishing, taking readers beyond the unexplained. The Moore Show is supported by Mindscape, paranormal and UFO matrix magazines, available for download on all major digital platforms. The comments and views expressed on The Moore Show are those of the people that make them and do not necessarily reflect the view of Kevin Moore, The Moore Show, or this radio station and its affiliate or sponsors. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Welcome back to the show. I'm still joined by my guest, Marshall Clarfield, author of the book, Adam the Missing Link and the Anunnaki Were Here. Marshall, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Kevin. Now, Marshall, in the blink of an eye, when you uh, look at mankind's evolution, in a sense, and what we have achieved now technology-wise as well, um, you know, it just makes you think, was some sort, did some source of information, was it, was it given to us? Was, you know, was it transferred to us, in a sense? Yes. I believe that the story of our creation, which is in my first book, Adam, The Missing Link, is that we were a, an experiment that the uh, Anunnaki wished to create kind of a, a primitive worker to help in their gold mining operations. And they uh, took the species Homo erectus, which were useless to them because they couldn't speak to them and they couldn't uh, give them any uh, instructions. And they performed what we call today uh, intro uh, fertilization. They took the, uh, according to the cuneiform tablets, and I'm not making this up, this is all reported through translations of cuneiform by Zacharias Hitchin. And he says they took the female egg of the Homo erectus, they scooped out the nucleus, and they put their DNA in there, and then they planted that into one of their birth mothers, an Anunnaki female. And there's a cylinder seal, uh, which I'll explain in a minute, that shows this operation and how they produced the first Homo sapien called Adamu, A-D-A-M-U, first person. So, I don't know if you can really prove <clears throat> that we, we came from evolution. I think we, you can't prove it because there isn't any skeletal physical remains to show that. So, if you uh, accept the translations of what they said they did, it makes sense to me because we're doing the same thing today. For females who cannot produce children, this process is exactly a uh, fertilized egg is placed in her womb and she, she has a child. Now... If this process is true, we have got the bicarmel uh, DNA of the Homo erectus and the DNA of the Anunnaki, so that we are uh, a hybrid uh, species. We are not pure Anunnaki and we're not pure Homo erectus. We're partway between. And this would maybe explain how our intelligence, which gave us a brain that was three times the size of the homo erectus brain, gave us vocal cords so we could talk and also be uh, commanded to do the work that they wanted us to do as primitive workers. But it also enabled our uh, intelligence to grow at a much rapid pace, much more rapid pace than, let's say, the million eight hundred thousand years that the homo erectus had taken to get to the stone tools and spears. In 200,000 years, We've created enough tools and information to be able to leave planet Earth and go to the moon. 
so that there has to be an explanation, Kevin, of how that's possible because evolution does not uh, provide that. That's too quick. In 200,000 years, a species does not advance that more rapidly. So we had to have some injection of advanced uh, uh, ability in our DNA, but also we probably got some technical transfers from them because in the story of Gilgamesh, which is the epic of Gilgamesh, uh, I wrote a book, uh, we wrote, my wife and I wrote together a book called Gilgamesh 10, in which it portrays the time in history, like 4,700 years ago, where the humans and the Anunnaki were cohabitating uh, a town in Sumaria called Uruk. And this was a, the first written story on our planet, it was called the Epic of Gilgamesh. But the fascinating part about this story is it tells about humans and, and uh, extraterrestrial species living side by side. And that, I think, is a, is a transfer of information to us about what our history was. And many of the stories in the Bible come from the cuneiform tablets of uh, uh, the history. For instance, the 11th tablet of the Epic of Gilgamesh talks about the Great Flood and what really happened and it talks about a, a character called Zizidaru, who was Noah in the Bible. And it's about a thousand years before the Bible was even written, Kevin. So that you can, uh, there's a movie coming out, uh, February or March of this year, called Noah. It's going to be a blockbuster uh, biblical story describing what uh, the people who produce it think the biblical story of Noah really was all about. But if you read my book, The Epic of Gilgamesh, uh, Gilgamesh 10, you'll find out that that wasn't the true story. It wasn't the real facts. But they, they had to deal with uh, how the species uh, survived after the flood. So putting all those creatures and, and animals on a barge uh, two by two, to me, was not a practical uh, story at all. It just, you know, how would you feed them? And once, if the earth got covered by 10 miles of mud after the flood was over, how would they survive if they, if they were able to come off the ark? Right. So there's right. A, lot of, a lot of holes in that story that's in the Bible. But the Gilgamesh story, the 11th tablet of the 12 tablet series of Gilgamesh, tells the real story of how it was done. It's fascinating. Okay. And, and, it, and, and very briefly, what was that story? They collected the DNA of all the Anunnaki who had this technology of, a, say, they were a million years more advanced than we were. They collected the DNA of everything and they put it in a little golden box. And they stuck the golden box on the ark with Noah and his family, which, by the way, that was a submarine, it was not a surface ship. Uh, the flood was not rain, as the Bible says, it was a tsunami. And, and what caused years. that? Pardon? What caused the, what caused the uh, tsunami, in a sense? Okay. In a sense, it was the reappearance of their home planet. See, their home planet was captured into our solar system, according to the translations. And it came in clockwise, and it was much bigger than Earth. And it, when it passed through the center of our solar system between Mars and Jupiter, it, it collided. One of its moons collided with Earth and, and cut it in half. And then it went back, and it travels every 3,600 years uh, back through the center of our solar system. So this was a time when it was coming back, and our planet had warmed up at that point and loosened the Antarctic ice shelf so that the gravitational effect of planet Nibiru coming through at this time slid the ice shelf, pulled the ice shelf into the uh, South Atlantic Ocean, caused a thousand-foot-high tsunami, which swept northward over Africa and through the Mediterranean, through Mesoamerica, and it just wiped out everything. All the surface life was destroyed. The fish survived in the sea. But in order to survive a, a tsunami, you had to have a submersible that could tumble and survive a wave of that magnitude, not something that sat on top of the water, which would be wiped out. So uh, there's evidence I produced in my book. Uh, there's a picture actually in the Karnak Temple and in the Abydos Temple uh, shows uh, advanced technology. And one of the objects there is a submersible with a snorkel on it. It's kind of interesting that they left us that clue. Right. But there's so much things. That oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, th th this is um, 
uh, a, a, large, a big subject, uh, what we're trying to cover in such a short amount of time right now. And why? So you say the Anunnaki came from a planet called Nibiru. Um, why have we not found Nibiru then? Well, we have. Uh, actually, our, uh, it's been a report in 1980 by uh, NSA that they uh, they spotted it, Harrington. It was published, the paper. I could produce all that for you, but I won't bother you with the details right now. It doesn't come back through the interplanetary system where you can see it except every 3,600 years. Now, we have documentation from previous civilizations who have encountered this phenomenon when it comes back through. And in my book on, uh, let's see what page that is. Oops. Anyway, here it is. Page 52. I produce all the civilizations that have seen Nibiru and what they called it. And I'll tell you, the first ones were the Sumerians. They called it Nibiru. The Babylonians called it Marduk. The Mesopotam Mesopotamians called it Marduk. The Hebrews called it the winged globe. The Hindus called it Tetra Yuga. The Egyptians called it the celestial disk. And the Greeks called it Nemesis. Now, we're talking about thousands of years of civilization. And, and one you know, of those names you mentioned there as well, I remember interviewing someone once who took someone, it was a, he was a past life regressionist, he took someone into a past life where they talked about a planet that had impacted on Mars called Meldek, I think they called it. Um, yeah. It just sounds familiar with, with what you're saying there. Well, I think the physical evidence that I look for, I'm kind of a tire kicker engineer type, is the Pacific Ocean. If you were to drain all the water off of planet Earth, you'd find that the Pacific Ocean was a big hole in our planet and it could have been caused by an impact from another celestial body that tore away that much of the uh, heavy material of planet Earth. And by the way, the asteroid belt, which is a debris belt that uh, orbits around uh, planet Earth, is the remains of, of the damage from that collision. And nice. the comets... The comets, which go clockwise, you know, everything in our solar system goes counterclockwise. All the planets uh, revolve around our sun in a counterclockwise fashion. Apparently, when Nibiru was captured, it was a, a space planet, free-forming, uh, free-floating space planet that was captured by uh, Neptune's gravitational, brought into our system in a clockwise fashion so that when it impacted Earth, it continued out in a clockwise, which is the direct path that the comets uh, take, which follow way out in past the Oort belt. Past so, so, so this could have affected uh, the craters on the moon. It could have, uh, you know, killed off Mars's atmosphere and and uh, uh, yes. vegetation and those stuff. Effects, yeah, those effects are written about. In fact, they they the Anunnaki before that happened had a way station on Mars. They they claim in their cuneiform stories that they had to take the gold from Earth and put it in a close by place, which was Mars, close to them, far for us. <laughs> but um, and at that time, Mars had an atmosphere and it had water, and there are some references to the fact that maybe their propulsion system was uh, used water because they refueled there. When they landed on uh, on inbound trips at Mars, the way station, they refueled with water and then they came to Earth. And then when they shipped the gold out, they shipped it from Earth to Mars, where then it was repacked and shipped back to Nibiru. Right. So this right. whole system was, is, is an incredible story, which I've, for years, as, as you indicated, been researching it and trying to put the pieces together. Now, it's connecting the dots of the facts that are on this planet Earth, the uh, pyramids, the Easter Island statues, Stonehenge, uh, the New World pyramids, the Inca walls, uh, the Mayan calendar, Newgrange. There's just dozens of things that are hard to explain. Yes. From our scientific point of view. And I think that if you think outside the box and say, well, if there was an advanced uh, E.T. civilization that colonized Earth 400,000 years ago. These things are all possible. Well, well can I ask you, do, do you think this race... Well, first of all, what, what did the race look like? What did the Anunnaki look like? Were they lizard-type? Were they like us? Or Okay, no, we're, we look like them. 
Okay. <laughs> if, they, if they were our creators, we look like them. Right. And there's an interesting thing. I can, your audience should go to Google and uh, write in capital V, capital A, 243. And that'll produce a cylinder sealed imprint of what they look like. In other words, they're self portraits. Now imagine this is the size of a cylinder seal. It's made out of a stone called hematite. Hematite is a black, very hard stone. It's magnetic, but it's as hard as steel. So what they did is they engraved these picture stories around the surface of this cylinder seal. So when you rolled it on wet clay, you got a positive picture. And if you go to VA243 at Google, you'll see this picture. Now, what's remarkable about it besides showing us what they look like, and we look like them, except they're older, they get beards and their big noses and big ears. Up in the left-hand corner, Kevin, of this particular uh, relief, when you roll out that cylinder seal, is a uh, diagram of our solar system with the sun in the center and the planets arrayed around it, detailed to the exact proportion of the planets. In other words, if you can imagine some had a technology that could engrave in the negative on steel, Incredible. stone that's hard as steel. And they gave us the information of the, the planets beyond what we could see at that time. And this is like uh, uh, 6,000 years ago. Uh, all you could see with your naked eye were the inner stone planets. The um, uh, Uranus and Neptune, which they described in great detail, are pictured on this cylinder seal. And that is uh, an amazing transfer of technology. What I'm saying is that this cylinder seal technology, the ability to store information, Kevin, that lasts for thousands and thousands of years is something we need to do. All of our technology, which you and I uh, pride ourselves in, that we store it on our computers, it's going to be gone in 100 years. Well, that's why, be... that's why they were put on, the, on this uh, t tablets Stone. and the stones and everything else. But, you know, it, it's, it's um, a question that's arising right now is if they were a, a millennia or thousands of years or hundreds of thousands of years more advanced than us, surely you'd think they'd be more spiritually advanced as well. Was this their, well, was this their gift to us? Did they not only help seed the planet in, in a sense, but their benefit was they could make workers in a sense to, to mine their gold that you refer to? Yes, but they, they did have a deity. This is the fascinating. You brought up a very interesting uh, subject, Kevin. We have religions, many of them on our planet now, which some of them were given to us by, I think, the Anunnaki as a control mechanism. But the belief in the ultimate creator of all, the ultimate question is, where did the universe come from? Where did the Anunnaki come from? Who created the Anunnaki? These are questions that uh, they probably struggled with, and they had a deity called the creator of all. So if this is the universal deity, um, I believe that the question of where everything came from is still to be answered. Uh, you know, I, I don't, people come to me and they say, are you trying to negate my religion? I said, no, you, you have faith. You should believe in your religion because you, there, there is no real answer to everything. And uh, I believe that uh, they were told by their creator of all, their deity actually it comes out in this epic of Gilgamesh, the 11th tablet, that story, that their destiny was to come to the planet Earth to create humans, Homo sapiens sapiens, and that the destiny of the Homo sapien species was to take care of planet Earth when it was turned over to us. Now, we've been in control of it, you know, perhaps for 2,000 years or so, um, but I don't think we're doing a very good job, Kevin. I don't think we are, in effect, uh, going to be able to preserve humanity. If, if we're actually at the tipping point right now, uh, we've, we've got um, the atomic weapons and the delivery vehicles to uh, totally obliterate our civilization. We can destroy ourselves. But in order to uh, overcome that, if we can, we've got to have some uh, political solutions, which we're not getting anywhere near. 
achieving them, or we have to have interference. And what I think, this is my own speculation, is that they have saved us once. In other words, the story of Noah in the Bible was the, the preservation of humanity from disaster, a flood that was going to kill everything. They preserved us. If they did that once, they might be willing to do it again okay. to save ourselves from ourselves. Well, we're just going to take a short break now, so stay tuned and we'll be right back. The Moore Show is in partnership with Ozark Mountain Publishing, taking readers beyond the unexplained. The Moore Show is supported by Mindscape, Paranormal and UFO Matrix magazines, available for download on all major digital platforms. The comments and views expressed on The More Show are those of the people that make them and do not necessarily reflect the view of Kevin Moore, The More Show, or this radio station and its affiliate or sponsors. This show is for entertainment purposes only. Welcome back to the show. I'm still joined by my guest, Marshall Clairfield. Now, Marshall, just before the break there, you were talking about, you know, they may come back. They've helped us before on the brink of annihilation, possibly. And, uh, you know, we are heading that way when you look at the way the planet's going. But surely our solution has to be a spiritual solution. Our solution has to come from that we are all connected. We are all family. We all come from the same source. What we do to another, we do to ourselves. I mean, don't you think it's more of a, a spiritual uh, sort of solution as well? Well, absolutely correct, Kevin. We share, all share, uh, we're all brothers under the skin. We have the same DNA. We have their DNA. Uh, we are the product of, a, of an advanced civilization that we even look like them, we're growing taller. They were uh, supposedly about nine feet tall, very tall species. And we're progressively getting to close to what they were. But what we need to understand, and I think you've pointed that out very clearly, is that spiritually, we don't kill each other. Uh, we're not here to, to uh, through greed or, or religious differences, be at war with each other. We are a very dangerous species. Uh, you know, I think if, if I was a extraterrestrial and I looked at planet Earth, I would not want to go there at all because we're, we're, we have wars continuously. Well, maybe you wouldn't interfere if you were a spiritually advanced, uh, at a spiritually advanced state because, you know, you want that race or that the, the, the mankind to make its own way into a sort of galactic federation in a sense. And I'm sure there's more species out there visiting planet Earth than just the, the Anunnaki who have. Yes, that's true. But let's, let's face the uh, fact that the only written words that we have, the only written documents, the cylinder seals and the cuneiform tablets are the database of one of the extraterrestrial species that were here, okay? The other uh, information comes from past life regressions and things that are not as solid uh, information based as what the Anunnaki, and let's examine them. Yes. Well, that's a, good, that's a good point. Let me just say, that's a good point, because have other scholars examined these uh, tablets, and have they come to the same conclusion that Zachariah Stitchin did? Yes. Yes. There's a full body now that is in correct and direct uh, confirmation of the translations that, that Zachariah took. There was over 300,000 cuneiform tablets. He took 2,000 of what he called the scientific ones that had information that was interesting. And those he translated and put into uh, six books called the Earth Chronicles. And then he wrote about seven or eight more books describing the same information in a different fashion. But I believe that this is the database that we have to examine and make some uh, conclusions from and get some uh, facts from. And, and the thing that you've brought up is who were they? I mean, what kind of people were the, the Anunnaki? And it turns out through the translations, that they were warlike people, that they kind of played games with humans and, and created uh, conflicts because they enjoyed watching wars. They also were extremely uh, oversexed. In some of the translations, you won't believe it. It makes all of the uh, soap operas you've ever heard look like nothing compared to what was involved in their realm. And they had a third characteristic, was they, they came for gold. So one day I said to myself, you know, geez, 
look at us humans. Uh, we uh, are over sex, we make war and we pursue gold. <laughs> I think that we in effect could be uh, indeed their offspring. But in order to uh, understand the story, there were two factions in the Anunnaki. There was the Enlil faction and the Enki faction. And it was Enki who saved us the first time against the will of his brother Enlil, who wanted to destroy us. He had had it with us. He Actually, uh, the story in the Bible of the uh, God that wanted to destroy humanity was, was Enlil. And uh, I think that we have to deal with the deck that we've been dealt, okay? And our genetic makeup uh, from our DNA uh, aspect is definitely from their species. We are their offspring, and therefore we are conflicted between uh, kindness and love and peace and war. And they, in effect, in order to control, here's another thing to think about, uh, Kevin, is that if you're a small, powerful group and there's billions of others around that you want to control, you have to have mechanisms. And they brought down from their civilization called kingship, which was the first control mechanism they brought down. And the second mechanism was religion. And religion is a very controlling uh, device. And of course, there are multiple religions which control multiple peoples. And we have to come to the realization that um, there isn't this my God is better than your God. We've got to get past that because these gods perhaps were in effect Anunnaki uh, princes who, who took the uh, position of being demigods. And in order to live in peace together, we must find a formula that uh, informs us, A, where we came from, B, what has been imposed on us, kingship and religion, and C, that this, you know, more people have died in the name of my God's better than your God. I mean, unfortunately... Well, can, can, I, can I just ask you a question? I mean, sure. you know, if you've got a, an advanced civilization coming down to mankind at that stage um, as well... Uh, even with, you know, genetic modification. So, you know, however many hundreds of years it took to, for us to become what we are right now with their help as well, uh, you would look up to them as gods. You would. So what they say would be taken uh, in a godlike way, wouldn't it? Absolutely. And that's what happened. In other words, the stories uh, before the Bible were exactly that. And then this uh, the first Bible was the Hebrew Bible, and that was uh, the first time, that, you know, for 6,000 years of our recorded civilization up to the uh, Romans, everybody worshipped uh, 12 different gods. There were, it was, we were all multi-god worshippers. And you can take the names of them and go trace the names of these uh, individuals' gods all the way back to the Sumerians, the two brothers, Enki and Enlil. Uh, for instance, uh, Enki in the Sumerian civilization was the water god, and Enlil was the commander. So we start with the Romans. Uh, you have uh, Jupiter, who's the commander god, and you have uh, Neptune, the water god, uh, the two brothers. You go back to the Greeks, it's Zeus and Poseidon. These are the same characteristics of these deities that were worshipped up to about 2,000 years ago. Yeah. So you're right that, the, that because they were so advanced and because they wanted to use their uh, superior technology to control the masses, uh, they did form these religions. And these religions were very demanding and very much in control. Thou shalt have no other god but me, right? Now, Marshall, when you consider uh, spiritual uh, messengers like uh, Muhammad or um, Jesus and, and other spiritual uh, figureheads, um, are you saying that it perhaps you know there is a connection with, with with them and the Anunnaki? Well, that's an excellent question, and perhaps one day I will uh, write about that aspect of it. Right now, I deal strictly with what I have. Uh, to uh, it's non-spiritual. It's a physical thing. There's wars, and the wars are generated by my God is better than your God. And uh, what we're confronting today uh, internationally uh, is a group 
that we now call terrorists that happen to come from a religion that says that, you know, unless you are a believer in their God, you're dead. And you got to undo that, Kevin. You can't live with a large number of people being controlled by a small uh, clergy that insists that everybody convert to their God. Until we can uh, level the playing field on who was God and what is the truth about uh, how we can live in peace together, we're going to have conflicts. And I think part of my research and my reporting on the Anunnaki is to bring forward what I've discovered uh, with the help of uh, Sitchin's translations, the truth about who we Homo sapiens sapiens are all about, how we came to be where we are today, and how we can perhaps throw off the yoke of oppression that has been placed on us by uh, the folks that put us together. Yeah. Or control mechanism. Once we can expose that, hopefully everybody will say, well, we're all brothers under the skin. Why are we killing each other? Well, perhaps if we all come from the same source, well, perhaps we are family then at a much deeper level. You know, perhaps we are a soul having a, a human existence, for example. Um, I don't know. But, uh, uh, but then let's move a little bit forward to um, the sort of biblical stories of creation as well, of Adam and Eve. I mean, how does that fit into your work? Okay. Well, the creation of Adam and Eve is explained in the uh, cuneiform tablets uh, and shown in the cylinder seals. There's a cylinder seal that shows actually the creation of Adam by, uh, by caramel fertilization. <clears throat> and the... You've got to realize that probably the scholars, Kevin, of, of antiquity went to libraries of cuneiform tablets. In other words, rich kings were able to assemble all the good stuff on the cuneiform tablets. And they were like Alexandria Library. You could go and study in this king's library the stories of, of what the Anunnaki had transferred to us. And from those stories, given the uh, limited technical framework in which the authors were writing this stuff, they took the story of Adam and Eve and they made it in the way they could understand it. That there was a superpower that out of the dust of the earth created Adam and Eve and Eve came from Adam's rib. You know, that story is also in the cuneiform tablets of how that experiment was done. Because if we are a bicarmal species, as it says in this story, we can't reproduce ourselves. In other words, if you mate a horse and a... And a Mule and a donkey, you get a mule, right? Horse and, and donkey gives you a mule. Mules cannot reproduce themselves. They're sterile. So when the Anunnaki created the primitive worker, Adam, from a bicarmal species, I mean from a Homo erectus and uh, their own DNA, they created Adam and, and a female Eve, but those two couldn't procreate because they were sterile. So you had to do another... Uh, operation, a four-way operation, which is explained in the cuneiform tablets. This is, I'm not making this up. This is all from the translations of the cuneiform tablets. In this four-way uh, operation with two Anunnaki and the two humans, Adam and Eve, they took something from maybe the marrow, the bone marrow from Adam's rib, and they transfused it into Eve and made her fertile. So the birth mothers, the Anunnaki birth mothers, were getting kind of tired of producing these primitive workers, and they wanted them to produce themselves. So what they did was they um, did this four-way operation, and that has a story that they were expelled from Eden. You know, that's how they translated this story, because they, they got to know what uh, procreation was. That's my interpretation of the uh, expulsion from, from Eden. Okay, uh, okay. You can, you can read all of this, you know, in an easier fashion. The reason I produced my books in the form that I did, if you saw that it was eight and a half by 11, I have over 80 to 100 color pictures in every book of the physical evidence of what I'm talking about. And I try to give you a uh, series of, of events and things that you can touch and feel and go examine for yourself and understand, you know, how the heck would you build a pyramid? Even with today's technology, what's inside of them is amazing. And I say to you, uh, make up your own mind. 
But here's an easy way to understand what Zechariah wrote in his books. His books are beautifully crafted there. He was a Hebrew scholar and he understood, he could read the uh, ancient text in both Hebrew and Sumerian uh, cuneiform. But have you ever tried to read one of his books? They're, they're a challenge, Kevin, I'll tell you. They, and I talked to him. I had a 10-year relationship with Zechariah. And I said, you know, Zechariah, I'd like to produce your book in a life magazine format so folks could understand in a more easy fashion what you're talking about in your scientific language. He said, fine, go ahead. So all the books that I've produced are in this life magazine format, eight and a half by 11 with lots of pictures. And the words explain a little bit of what the pictures were, 10,000 words. And you will see the evidence, the physical evidence in Adam, the Missing Link, my first book, uh, over 14 pieces of physical evidence that we could not have uh, created with our technology. No, no. And I, and I really do like your book for, for, you know, your books from that standpoint as well. With, with, with the pictures, it just it's just easier to sort of digest as well. And uh, no, I, I have read some of uh, Stitchin's books and uh, um, yeah, I, I was just about to get the last interview with Stitchin before he passed away. Uh, he actually wrote me a letter and, and gave us the blessing to do the interview. And uh, just a couple of weeks after that, we, I found that he was taken into hospital. Um, yeah, well, that's, that's a shame because he was yeah. brilliant. And, um, yeah, I, I I looked at him as my teacher. I mean, I studied under him, and now I've more or less, as you may have gathered, uh, become a disciple of Sitchin. I'm oh. out there uh, defending him and ex and expanding on what he discovered. I'm discovering new things. I wish I could have shared yeah. with him. Because some of the stuff is is really remarkable. Oh, well, he's but, he's with you. Don't worry about that. Sh looking down on you. <laughs> Well, thank you, Kevin. I appreciate that. But I want your audience to try to, uh, you know, I'm kind of a reporter. I just tell you what's there. and You have to make up your own mind as to what you want to believe about it. Yeah. But uh, as a researcher and a reporter, I think I've come close to what is, I call the truth. And if we can understand the truth, it should set us free. It should free us to be able to live in love and peace, as you said, which is the way we were supposed to live. Yes. And get rid of this evil part of us that, that is being used to uh, keep our numbers down and to control us so that uh, we don't become as powerful as they, they are. Well, who knows? We may be on a, as a soul, we may incarnate on a planet which needs opposites. Just as you need to know what hot is, you know, you need to know cold. You need to know the opposites. And, uh, you know, what better way to have an experience on a, on a planet like this? I mean, um, we just don't know, do we? And, and we can, and no. there's lots of uh, truths out there. And uh, you have to pick the one that, that fits in with uh, how, well, what, think, what feels best for you. I think what you're doing, Kevin, is marvelous. In other words, your medium that you've done on your own here. And interviewing folks like myself and others uh, to get these stories to your audience and to the, as many people as possible is, is the best thing as an as a individual that I think you can do. That's what I'm trying to do. And I'm kind of uh, closer to the end than the beginning of this whole thing. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, I, I, you, you, you've, you've got some re really interesting work to come on. I know that. And just very quickly, I will say that, uh, you know, if you go back to the original scrolls of the Bible, for example, the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, they're very different. It's a very different sort of uh, less fear-based outlook uh, than the more modern-based um, 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 re religious texts in a, in, a, in a sense. Yes, yes. In fact, there's much information that's coming out of the Dead Sea Scrolls that, in effect, is challenging some of the stories that have been in the uh, New Testament. I don't think they, well, they might challenge some of the stuff in the Old Testament too, but I think the, the Hebrew Torah, the five books of Moses, uh, which, by the way, has been the most meticulously translated and, and reproduced of any document that I've ever heard about, that if they made a mistake, they tore it up and started over again. So they got it just right. So that those um, stories came directly from the cuneiform tablets, the scholars who, who put together the, yeah. uh, the, the Torah, I believe. Uh, Moses was illiterate. He couldn't read nor write, as was Muhammad. Neither of these uh, prophets could could uh, read or write. So the texts that they brought from above had to come from a more advanced uh, technology. 
Absolutely. And uh, you mentioned before in the interview as well uh, about the uh, pyramids. And it's incredible to think that perhaps the uh, the, the Egyptian writing and the the um, all the information on the walls in the pyramids, uh, that may have been put on at a later date prior to what they originally were built for. And oh, it, yeah. it does make you think as well about, about stories of, of Atlantis and, and, and the Lemurians as well. We, you know, yes. who were they? Where did they come from? Right, right. Well, you see, I, I, I believe that <clears throat> most, if not all, of the megalithic monuments like the pyramids and Easter Island statues and the Mesoamerican pyramids were inherited by the civilizations that are given credit for them. In other words, I think the Egyptians inherited the pyramids, yes. the Easter Island folks inherited the, the statues, the uh, Aztecs, the Incas, the Mayans, they all inherited uh, stone structures, which, by the way, have a lot of similarities in their construction. That's what is, is interesting. They're, they're stone blocks put together without mortar. No, they weren't glued together in any way. They were designed so beautifully that they could withstand the stresses and the weights, but were just stacked perfectly close edge to edge. And that technology is what uh, has brought me to my, my current research and the fact that uh, I'm finding a commonality through most of these uh, icons of civilization that have a, a branding or a... a a marking of an advanced technology, which the only one that I happen to know about is the Anunnaki. Now, yeah. there are others that I've heard about, and I've, I have a daughter in New Mexico who is a hypnotherapist, and she does pass life regressions, and she knows about all these other ETs, but <clears throat> I haven't experienced that. And someday she said she's going to help me maybe see that so that I can talk more well, intelligently. That's... Uh, that is incredible. Um, okay, well, we're going to get you back on for another show because we've, you know, there's no way we can fit in your next book into this because it's. Uh, I want to give it justice as well. So, um, just very briefly for the audience, what is your website address and how can people get a copy of your book as well? Okay, well, the best place, to, the store I have on my website, and by the way, the name of the website is the title of the first book, AdamTheMissingLink.com. If you just put it. AdamTheMissingLink.com in Google, you get right to my website. Right. And those books are available, all of the three of the books that I've written so far. They are available elsewhere, but I'll tell you, the best the bargains you can find are direct from the source, as it were. There's no middleman to add cost to it. So it's, it's interesting. AdamTheMissingLink.com, and you'll find me. Okay. Well, Marshall Clarfield, thank you so much for joining us today, and I look forward to getting you back on the show. Very good, Kevin. Look forward to it myself. And thank you again for the interview. Well, we've come to an end on tonight's show. Don't forget that you can listen and watch all our past shows on the More Shows official YouTube channel. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel for new daily shows. You may also find out more on our past and upcoming guests via themoreshow.co.uk and do like us on Facebook and Twitter for the latest updates. So until next time, be safe. The Moore Show is in partnership with Ozark Mountain Publishing, taking readers beyond the unexplained.